Good morning. Welcome to New Beginnings Worship. My name is Pastor Neil Platon, and I'm your North Campus Pastor. We're glad that you're here with us this morning as we worship God together and as we acknowledge and honor our 2020 graduates. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, reflect on these words. We gather this day to acknowledge a threshold moment, a thin place between what has been and what's to be. It's also a time of looking back and looking ahead. May it be also a time of gratitude and anticipation, of an awareness of how we grow our life along with our whole person, our minds, bodies, spirits, and emotions. May it be also a time of profound sense of what it means to place our way where we've been and when we're going within the way of our Lord. To this end, let us worship God. Good morning, New Beginnings. I'm your liturgist, Liz Rourke. Please join in with me in the call of worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The, the earth has yielded its, its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. All, Let all the ends of the earth revere him. him. How wonderful are the works of your hands as we gather here today to celebrate a step forward into new places with new people and new experiences let us not forget the blessings that follow behind us for the different schools and institutions which have given us a safe place to learn and a strong foundation to build upon as we take this next step into your world 
for the hardships and tears we have endured together side by side, and for your love which has been made evident through the relationships we will carry with us. May we continue to lay down our lives for each other just as you, O Lord, gave up your life for each of us. Let us love each other fearlessly and seek your will earnestly all the days of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, New Beginnings family. Today is Graduate Recognition Sunday, so we will be acknowledging our 2020 graduates in a little bit. But here are some of the church announcements for the week of June 14. Fourth of July weekend is fast approaching, and our church has a fireworks booth, and if you'd like to help, you can contact Deb McKenzie at 909-754-3325. Next Sunday is Father's Day. If you would like to send your best dad pictures, you can send it through Fernando. You can email him at fernandowestry at gmail.com. Our North Campus accompanist, Leanne Maloof, is retiring next Sunday. If you would like to send video greetings to her, you can do so by sending your videos to Fernando Westry as well. Please note that next week is annual conference week for our church. And so both of our Bible studies for Tuesday and Friday will be on break. If you have any prayer request, you can go on our website at nbie.org or call our church office at 909-515-5770. We would like to thank those of you who have been supporting our church through your giving. Please note that you can still write your checks and mail it to either the North or the downtown campuses. Or you can go to our website and click on the giving tab on nbie.org. You can also give through text. Here's now a short video on how you can text to give. Some 
drops like a lemon drops high above the chimney top. That's where you find me, oh, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. The dream that you dare to. Why, oh why can't I, I, I ooh, 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 Holy God, you have called us to be diligent teachers and eager learners in all that we do, both in this community and in your larger world. Now send us forth into that world as your willing servants. Give us the strength lightly to bear our joys and sorrows. Give us the strength to make our love fruitful in service. Give us the strength never to disown the poor or bend our knee before its insolent might. Give us the strength to raise our minds high above earthly trifles, and give us the strength to surrender our strength to your will with love. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer as we sing, Spirit of the Living God. Let us pray. O God, who has created your children to be free, we attest in word and deed that you are our God and we are your people. From our earliest days, you have called us forth from self-seeking, bondage, comfort, complacency, and complaint to freeing and redeeming action for justice everywhere in the world. Lord, we pray for the wisdom to discern your call in our lives. We pray for the wisdom to make healthy choices in the face of endless and confusing options. We pray for the grace to redefine our relationships as our lives change as we follow you. We pray for the grace to form new relationships as we move forward from this place to the world you call us to serve. We pray for the courage to swim against the current of society as we seek to follow where you lead us. We pray for the courage to take a stand with you for justice and peace in this world in this time. For we pray all of this and the concerns that we have in our hearts in the name of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The scripture lesson will be found in Matthew 9, 35 and continuing through 10, 8. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. May the love of Christ add meaning to this reading.
There are some things in life that you just can't do it by yourself. I wonder if you can think of any. Tug of war, perhaps, is one. Marriage is another. You can't date or have a deep conversation by yourself. It is impossible to hug alone, but maybe you can. You can't even offer a simple, friendly handshake if there's not another hand on the other side. Yes, it's true that no matter how strong our wishes or desires are, there are some things in life, perhaps more things than we care to acknowledge, that just aren't meant to be done by one person alone. Try seesawing yourself. Two people hanging a wallpaper works much better than just a single person. A funny movie is even funnier when it's shared with someone else. And dinner at a restaurant tastes a lot better and is a lot more enjoyable when there's someone else sitting at the end of the table. It seems that is not God's plan for some things to be experienced or done alone. Take the work of ministry. Ministering in Jesus' name isn't meant to be done as a solo activity, which of course is why God created and to this day is still creating church communities like New Beginnings, groups of people working together, serving the Lord together, working in unison and doing their part as individual members of the body of Christ. When Jesus was conducting his early ministry, He discovered that the work of sharing the good news of God's kingdom was something best not done by himself, even if it was possible for him to do that. At some point in time, Jesus came to realize that doing it without help was impractical and inefficient. There were better, much more effective ways to share the word and much or make sure it continued to be shared. And one of those ways was to add recruits, other helpers. Matthew's gospel today described how Jesus perceived the hurt and the brokenness around him. In the cities, towns, and villages he traveled to, everywhere he looked, our Lord encountered people who yearned to hear a message of hope who wanted the healing presence of God to come into their lives, who needed care and compassion. Jesus' reaction probably wasn't any different than our own reaction to how fragmented and wounded the world is today. Just watch the news on television, scan the internet, read the front page of any newspaper, and we can't help but think, I knew things in the world were bad, but this bad? Although we may try to convince ourselves otherwise, the world hasn't changed much since Jesus' day. In fact, a strong argument could be made that things have been on a downward slide from then to now. Our world, like the world that Jesus inhabited, contains so much heartache and heartbreak that at times it can be overwhelming. 
people everywhere, including nation that ever existed, are living in pain, fear, and despair. And we know that as individuals, the little we might be able to do to help make things better is just a drop in the bucket. When Jesus began to mix and mingle with the crowds, the way he did in our reading from Matthew this morning, he recognized how desperation and misery had overtaken many people's lives. He saw countless people who were, as Matthew put it, harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Maybe that was the moment when Jesus realized he couldn't adequately address all this pain, despair, and need by himself. And even if he put his small band of 12 disciples to work, it wouldn't be enough to get the job done. So Jesus did more than just tell his disciples to help him. He also urged them to pray. For God to send many more workers into the field to assist in the great harvest of proclaiming the good news to the needy and the hurting people. Jesus knew fully well that his task was great, which is why he decided that the work God had sent him into the world to do was something best not done alone. During those early days of Jesus' ministry, he came to understand that it was unreasonable and unrealistic to go about proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God by himself. Not only would it take longer than necessary to spread the gospel, but he would have greater success if that message was also shared by his followers, those who had taken his message to heart and wanted to carry it forward. If Jesus had decided to proclaim the gospel alone without any help, then when he died, that message could very well have died with him. Jesus must have understood instinctively, if nothing else, that the kind of substantial change and social transformation he had in mind was most likely to happen and continue when ordinary people like you and me become enthusiastic advocates for it. For Jesus' vision of the kingdom to become a reality, everyday people moved by the Spirit of God first had to be convinced that the teachings and the principles of the kingdom truly mattered and would make a real difference in the world. And those people would be the ones to share it and embody it. If Jesus' message was to take root and continue to spread, it needed to be proclaimed by more voices than just His. And that is why He prayed and worked so diligently to enlist others in helping Him accomplish the kingdom-building mission that he was on. And as I'm sure you realize, it was from this recruitment of other workers to go into the harvest field and work to build up God's realm that the church sprung up and was born. The church is a community of laborers working together in the field, the world, to bring in God's harvest. And the harvest is anyone who hasn't already heard or responded to Jesus' call to believe in Him and follow Him. So what is the end result that you and I and all Christians are being called to strive toward? What was the ultimate purpose Jesus wanted to see come about? Robert McAfee Brown, a Presbyterian minister, and professor of theology wrote something that I think can help us envision the goal we're seeking as we work together in God's field. He wrote the following reflection in response to the question, what is the meaning of life? He said, Ralph Sumner died the other day, full of years, 80 plus, and wisdom as a dairy farmer, 
cabinet maker, member of the local road crew, and church goer. When we laid him in the ground, there were some tears, but there was also a lot of gratitude for the joy he had spread around the folks of Heath, Massachusetts. Ralph's death made me think about my own life and our mutual human purpose. I believe we're placed here on earth to be companions. A wonderful word that comes from the Latin companis, or in English, with bread. We are here to share bread with one another so that everyone has enough. No one has too much. And our social order achieves this goal with maximal freedom and minimal coercion. There are many names for such sharing. Utopia and the beloved community, the communion of saints, the kingdom of God, and while the goal of bringing the reality such loving, caring companionship is far too vast to be brought to fruition solely on this planet, it is our calling and task as Christians to create the foretaste of it, to offer the world living glimpses of what life according to God's will is supposed to be and will be after Christ returns at the end of the age. This foretaste includes things such as art and music and poetry and shared laughter and picnics and politics and moral outrage and special privileges for children only and wonder and humor and the endless immeasurable love, enough love to counterbalance the otherwise immobilizing realities that exist here in the world today. But McAfee concluded, I expect that our deceased friend, Ralph Sumner, now sees such a world more clearly than I do. My friends, by its very nature, and because it's such a lofty goal that Christ our Lord has set for us as harvesters for God. The work we Christians are called to do is best not done alone. It is most effectively done by each and every one of us, by all of us together. Many different individuals, Christians and churches of every faith and denomination working side by side, harvesting for God as a united community. And that's the only way we can possibly hope to accomplish any of God's work. And by the way, that work isn't meant to be done just within the four walls of the church. We're called to go out and do it in everyday rough and tumble world in which we live. The dirty, the gritty places around us where we encounter the helpless, the harassed, and the hungry. That's where the good news of God's compassion, justice, and mercy most desperately need to be proclaimed and heard. Of course, going to such places, it will be risky and uncomfortable, to say the least. It might also be distressing and unpleasant, discouraging and despairing, and at times, it can even be dangerous. And we see this a lot these days of people acting sacrificially in a Christ-like manner and at times getting involved and at times getting wounded in the process. They could have very easily been killed along with many other people, but they did it anyway. Such is the risky field that we're called to harvest in. But it's imperative that the message of God's kingdom and God's love be proclaimed even more boldly and emphatically the face of such self-senseless, horrific violence, irrational hatred, and destructive anger. And because of the risks and the challenges that we face for announcing the good news of the gospel in a world full of violence, hatred, and anger, it is best not done alone. 
My friends, just as it was in Jesus' day, in the year 2020, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are still few. Just Jesus has put out the call, many more hands are needed for the work of God. God's labor force encompasses the whole people of God, all the disciples of Jesus, each of us supporting, encouraging, and helping one another, working, sharing bread, and worshiping God together. We are to do this to give people a foretaste of God's kingdom and show the world what God's love, grace, and compassion is all about when they are lived out in each of our lives. I know it is a daunting task, to be sure, and we take it on with the full realization that we will never be able to completely accomplish it. What the Lord is asking of us is to do what we can, the best that we can, to accomplish whatever small portion of God's harvest we're able to get done. And along with that, we're also urged to pray fervently, just as our Lord did, for God to encourage more people to come join us in the field, people who understand as you and I do, that following Christ and doing God's work in this world can be very difficult challenging, and risky. So it is best not done alone. So I encourage you, my dear friends, to come and join us as we continue with the work of the kingdom. May it be so as we continue with our life together and with our God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
gracious and loving God, as we conclude our service, we ask for your hand to be upon each and every one of us. May your people find comfort, O God, in our community. May our people find support as they journey through life. May they find strength in the presence of our God. We ask, O Lord, that you'll bless their lives with goodness and success. Enable them, O God, to stay true to their life's purpose for your greater glory, to discern what is good, right, and just, and to use their gifts wisely in service to others. Empower them, O God, to walk into the future with faith, hope, and great love guided by your light so that their talents can be used for the growing of your kingdom. In the words of St. Ignatius of Loyola, may they go forth in God's name and set the world on fire. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, our service is now over, but our life with God and with each other continues. Hear now our benediction. May we go forth, God seeing in our eyes, God touching with our hands, God caring through our generosity and love. Go in peace, my dear friends, and until we meet again, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.